I'd like to welcome our esteemed guest panelists, Academy of Art University students and members of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art to our exclusive live webinar, The Life and Legacy of Paul R. Williams, Hollywood's Architect to the Stars. My name is Kay Evans, and I'm Vice President of the Academy of Art University School of Interior Architecture and Design, and I will be your host this evening. As an interior designer myself for over 50 years, I have long been familiar with the work of Paul Revere Williams. When I was a young designer living in Southern California, I used to pile my kids in the car and drive around Los Angeles with my tourist map that I bought for 50 cents at the corner of Hollywood and Vine. And it showed all the Hollywood stars homes. And um, I circled all the things that I wanted in red. They were all the Paul Williams homes. And um, then I would drive around until I found them and I'd get out of the car and I'd stand in front of that home for what seemed like hours and I'd study every detail and I would be feverishly praying that the owner would come out and invite me in and have a cup of coffee and tour the house. Well, that never happened. But my enthusiasm for Paul Williams and my passion for his work never waned. So if we fast forward then many years later, I'm now living in San Francisco. And one afternoon last year, I had a chance meeting with Royal Rogers while walking down Fillmore Street. And she told me about a documentary she and her partner, Kathy Vance, had just completed. She said she was in town for a meeting with PBS to discuss their picking it up for Black History Month. So I asked what the documentary was about. And when she replied, an architect, his name is Paul Williams. You can only imagine how I felt. I begged Royal to keep in touch with me and let me know as soon as she, as she could when I could view the documentary, which she did. Then several months after that, my good friend Brett, Rod, or Brett Parsons called to tell me that his new book, the fourth in a series of 12 volumes, entitled Master Architects of Southern California, 1920 to 1940, co-written with Mark Appleton and Stephen G, was about to be released. And by the way, the new book was about the work of Paul Williams. So honestly, I became convinced that I needed to start listening to the universe, which brings us to this exciting evening when we can all bring uh, Paul Williams to the students and to members of the ICAA. So I thank you for all previewing this important PBS documentary. I absolutely love the film. I am delighted to introduce you to uh, the directors and the producers of this award-winning film. So Royal, Royal Ro Kennedy Rogers is a producer, director, and writer with experience in local and network news, as well as in public broadcasting. She began her career as a reporter with NBC in New Orleans, Cleveland, and Chicago, then a correspondent with ABC in Los Angeles. She was covering assignments as varied as breaking news, uh, political assignments, and the entertainment industry. Royal's public broadcasting experience includes producing and reporting for Chicago Tonight, a PBS nightly news and public affairs program. Her professional awards include a local Emmy, a Silver Telly Award in the television biography category, as well as recognition for her news reporting from the San Francisco School of Journalism and the American Association of Trial Lawyers. She is currently an independent producer based in Washington, D.C. Kathy, her partner, Kathy McCampbell Vance, is an Emmy Award winning television producer, director, and former TV executive. She is currently an independent producer specializing in short form story production, news, and documentaries. Prior to becoming an independent, documentarian or an independent producer, I'm sorry, Kathy worked at NBC4 in Washington as a writer, executive producer, and ultimately 
Director of Programming, Community Fairs, and Broadcast Standards. In addition to several Emmys, she has received numerous other awards in journalism, and most recently a telly for the film Hollywood's Architect, The Paul Williams Story. Brett Parsons has written five books, including Colcord Home, the biography of Southern California architect, Gerard Colcord. Brett, a top producing Los Angeles realtor, is the founder and executive director of the architectural division of Compass in Beverly Hills. He spent a decade as a mortgage broker and was vice president of business development at the Pacific Design Center in Los Angeles. Brett's entertaining presentations about notable homes and their cultural impact are always sold out. Brett resides in Los Angeles. Mark Appleton is the founding principal of Appleton Partners Architects with offices in Santa Barbara and Santa Monica. A graduate of Harvard College, Mark received his architectural degree from the Yale School of Architecture. He has been named to the list of Architectural Digest top 100 designers since its inception in 1991, and has written and contributed to many books on architecture. Mark makes his home in Santa Barbara. Stephen G is a writer and television producer based in Los Angeles, who started his career as a newspaper reporter in Norfolk, England. He too is the author of many architectural books, including The History of Art and Architecture, which won the Glenn Goldman Award for Art, Architecture, and Photography, presented by the Southern California Independent Booksellers Association. He also wrote, directed, and produced the award-winning PBS documentary, Iconic Vision, John Parkinson, Architect of Los Angeles. This trio of writers will tell you more about Paul Williams. Then after they finish their presentation, Royal and Kathy will join us all for a question and answer session. So Brett and Mark, take it away. Uh, long attracted to the architecture of the early 20th century. I was particularly enamored of the 1920s and 30s, the years between World War I and World War II. Uh, in Southern California and, and other parts of the country as well, these were boom times, uh, especially around Los Angeles. And a man named John Brassfield uh, came up with an idea to come out with a magazine called The Architectural Digest about 1920. And this is the forerunner to architectural digest that most of us are familiar with today, although it's a much uh, glitzier and more international publication that focuses a lot on fashion and interior design and a little less on architecture. In the early days of the architectural digest, it was all about architecture and all about specifically architecture centered around the metropolitan Los Angeles area. Um, and in the early years, he published uh, uh, much of the work of architects like Gordon Kaufman, Reginald Johnson, Roland Cote, Wallace Neff, and tonight's focus, Paul Williams. Um, I was an avid fan of the magazine. And uh, Brad, I think you can probably bring up the covers at this point. Um, yeah. And uh, these early issues were, were really wonderful. And it, it used to be that I could buy them for money that I could afford. Nowadays, if you find an issue uh, like this, it's, it's generally in the hundreds of dollars. Um, but when I met Brett, uh, we both realized that we shared the same passion for uh, the work uh, of the 20s and these early architectural magazines. And we decided to pool our resources. We didn't have a full collection of the Architectural Digest, but when we engaged a third uh, uh, fan, Steve Vaught, we realized we now had a complete collection of the, of the magazine or close to complete. And the idea for the series was gonna be reborn at this point. It was an idea that I'd earlier had and spoke to Architectural Digest about, and they in fact weren't initially interested. 
uh, in the idea. Um, some of these architects have been largely forgotten uh, and there were few or no books on them. And part of the reason for us deciding to publish a series was to remind people that this work was really special. These architects were special and we really needed to be mindful of and caretake um, the kind of thing that was happening, which was the loss of a lot of these houses and a lot of these, these buildings. Um, we also realized that the architects that were represented in the Architectural Digest, many of them didn't have books on their work, so they weren't in the public eye. Uh, this was particularly true of the first two architects we chose, Gordon, Gordon Kaufman and Roland Cote, for whom there was really no exposure except in these early magazines. Um, and with that, Brett, let's bring up the series so far. We thought the first book would come out uh, in a year, the second would be in a se second year, the third in a third year, and the fourth uh, in a fourth. And it, we were going to be doing one of these a year. It turned out that the first book probably took us three years to get off the ground. Uh, the second one was equally uh, long, long, a long haul. Uh, but now we, we've sort of hit our stride and the Wallace Knapp book came out last year and this year Paul Williams uh, were celebrating. So we're, we're kind of delighted that this series now has some legs as a series and wasn't just an, a, a, an occasional book or two. And with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Brett, who's going to take you through some of the early pages here sure. of, of the books. Thanks, Mark. And thank you, Kay, for including us tonight. We're going to start out with book number one, which came out in 2016. And Mark is correct. It took over three years to produce the, the, the very first book. Um, to reiterate what Mark had said earlier, we chose between 1920 and 1940 because we were between World War I and World War II obviously be, between the wars. It was what's often referred to as the golden era of architecture. If you're living in New York City, you'll notice there are many ads that say pre-war building. That's pre-World War II. The reason the period was illustrious and prosperous and robust is between the wars, America was quite prosperous and we were building mansions and we basically, the sky was the limit. Also during this time period, because there was no war going on, no products were shipped overseas. All the products were available here, the top quality products such as a Redwood two by four that actually measured two by four, two by six. We had the greatest materials available at our disposal to build these homes. And second of all, you had father to son training. In those years, it was quite uh, prestigious to work for dad. And chances are when you were 14 or 15, you began learning at the knee of your father, whatever his trade was. Many businesses at the time were, for example, Brett Parsons and son. That was revered. That was a very big deal. Therefore, the craftsmanship was first rate. You don't have that today. After World War II, everybody came back to higher paying jobs and the and son aspect lost its luster. First book was on Gordon Kaufman, obviously, and there he is right there. Uh, we always have a third author for our books. In this case, it was Steve Vaught, who did much of the research. Gordon Kaufman, extraordinary architect. You're looking right now at a home that's in Hancock Park in Los Angeles. It's actually the largest house still to this day in Los Angeles. It would be owned by many illustrious folks, including Antonio Banderas and Melanie Griffith. And it recently sold to the head of content for Netflix, Ted Sarandos and his wife. It's an absolutely glorious house that uh, is, is hosts many, many political functions to this day. It's quite extraordinary property. And as such, it made the cover. This is La Colina that Kaufman did in the 20s. If you're familiar with Los Angeles geography, it's right behind the old hamburger hamlet there at La Colina and um, Doheny Road. It's been recently renovated, beautifully done by designer Tim Corrigan. It's quite an extraordinary property to this day, and they're buying back parcels to hopefully cobble it back together into the original uh, estate size. And there's a picture again of the, the house that was on the cover. In our books, we try to include floor plans as much as possible. People love floor plans. It's an extraordinary house any way you look at it. 
Here's some of the detailing. I believe this one's from La Colina. The, the, the tile surround is breathtaking. Keep in mind, that's probably about 16 feet high to the ceiling. And then here we have a house in uh, San Marino, which is right next door to Pasadena. And this just shows you the, the groin bolts uh, that for the, for the loggia that Kaufman did. He, he was a superb architect. He also did Greystone, probably Los Angeles' most famous home that was built for the Doheny family. Uh, not only is it, is it architecturally significant, but there's also a rather notorious past to it. It is owned by the city of Beverly Hills and you're able to tour it. And we're gonna finish up with Kaufman right here. This is up at Hope Ranch in Santa Barbara and it's a beautiful Spanish style structure. But what's so interesting is that, um, uh, that entryway, so to speak, although I believe it's a loggia, it's a wonderful framing device. Architects were very bright in that if you give something a frame, you can see more of it. The eye is being told where to look, and because of that, your, your, your view is much greater than if that arch was not there. Oh, here's, here's the Athenaeum in uh, Pasadena. Uh, again, the extraordinary level of detail is a little mind-boggling. Luckily, it still exists. And here he did, this is more of his modern work, but he did the Santa Anita Park in Arcadia. Notice the modern influences here. The sculptural uh, work there is actually horses that are racing. These architects were very well trained. They often could practice in any style you can imagine. And as the decades went on, they did more and more modern work. And this still exists to this day. You can see it. We then shifted to Roland Coat. And by the way, each of these books is sponsored by a local vendor. Um, they're very, very expensive to produce, mainly because of the four color process. Even though they're black and white, we do use a four color process to, to make them the, the sharpest images possible. Uh, this one was uh, sponsored by Russ Diamond from Schneider Diamond uh, here in Los Angeles. Absolutely fantastic vendor and, and, and friend to all of us for many, many years. Um, our second book was on Roland Cote. He's com commonly known as the father of the Monterey colonial revival style, uh, that often being the balcony that's over the first floor. The home here on the cover is in Santa Barbara. Absolutely picturesque. This is Hancock Park. This is the uh, Fudger estate that's on Mirafield Road, still intact, I'm very happy to say. Probably one of his greatest residential works. And here's another Monterey Colonial home. This one's in Santa Barbara as well. It just has all the endearing qualities. That, that balcony is, is just extraordinary. Coat, again, we were just looking at Monterey Colonials. He also did Italian palazzos. And right here, you're looking from the loggia out to the rear garden. Um, many of you will know the name Betsy Bloomingdale. This was her home from the 50s until a couple of years ago when she died, and it had been extraordinarily renovated by designer Billy Haynes. But this is the way the house started out. It became very fashionable, but in its early days, it was quite a lovely mansion, and you'll see it all in the book. Now, we just went from a from Monterey Colonial to a Palazzo and now to a Tudor revival. This one is in Hancock Park. It recently sold for $11.5 million, all cash. There were 11 offers. It sold very, very quickly. You're looking at over 10,000 square feet and an attic that is probably 3,000 square feet. It's in marvelous shape. And it's very eye-catching. It's on a prominent street, Hudson. In, in Hancock Park, but just a wonderful house. It's just off of Beverly, in case you're in the area. And then he also did the home that Danny Kay would reside in for many, many years. Um, this is in Beverly Hills, still intact. A uh, wonderful period piece. And then uh, uh, Daniel Oselznik. And of course, he was most famous for being the producer of Gone with the Wind. And I said, Daniel, I'm sorry, it's David Oselznik. And this is on Summit Drive in Beverly Hills. The house itself is still intact, although some of the lots have been sold off. And of course, Francis Elkins would have done the original interiors. 
Our third book in the series was Wallace Neff, and that was sponsored by Michael Grosswent of All Coast Construction. This came out last year. Wallace Neff is probably the greatest architect from the standpoint of appropriate architecture for Los Angeles. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright said that a home should be of the hill and not on the hill. It should look as if it's an outcropping of the land. Wallace Neff had that down in spades. His homes looked organic and looked as if they came right out of the ground belong there and had been there for many, many years. This is a home in Pasadena right here. And in the middle of that arch is called the donkey arch. Uh, a man would ride on a donkey or burrow and the arch would be big enough to let the animal and the, uh, and the person ride through it. That's why it's called the donkey arch. It's pointed at the top. And here we have a home. Uh, this is Beverly Hills, the Neblo house. Um, this one's interesting in that they designed the motor court. You can look at the bottom left, that round circular motor court. They designed it around the radius of a luxury automobile. That's what created the radius for this house. Then he did French Normandy. Look at that beautiful dovecote right there. This is on Alpine and Beverly Hills. He, he, he could change styles beautifully. And then this is his own home in San Marino. He would live there for about 10 years until he was divorced, but it just, it's absolutely beautiful to this day and it sold about five years ago. Here again is that, what I called earlier a framing device. This is the Gillette Ranch in Calabasas with a beautiful vista, but you see so much more of it framed by the archway off the rear loggia and the fountain. You can tour this. Post COVID, it will open up again. It's off of Mulholland Highway in Calabasas. There he, we're back to his French Normandy. This one had quite an illustrious beginning and still to this day, it was built for an actor named Frederick March, quite an esteemed actor. And then uh, Wallace Annenberg would own this for many years during the seventies. It would then sell to Brad Pitt and Jennifer Aniston who loved period architecture. And then um, it is in Homeby Hills, which is in between Beverly Hills and Bel Air, French Normandy style. And now for the subject of tonight, Paul Williams. You're looking at a home that he did in Windsor Square, which is at Tancock Park, probably Paul Williams' most favorite home that he did. He's reported as saying that. Paul Williams did about 2,000 homes and about 1,000 commercial structures. All I can say about Paul Williams is he is a god. He's probably one of Los Angeles' greatest architects. Um, just an extraordinary man in every way, an extraordinary family, and, till, and still to this day, no pun intended, but his projects are revered, uh, his middle name being Paul Revere Williams. Um, I'm going to pass this over to Stephen G., and you're going to learn all about Paul Williams, an extraordinary, extraordinary man in every category you can imagine. Um, thank you for this opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm so grateful, too, that we, we get to sit on a panel with um, Royal and Kathy, who produced such a, a wonderful, insightful, and, 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 and moving tribute to Paul Williams. Um, whose career is really um, remarkable for many reasons, and, and some of which are talked about all the time, and, and some of which are, are, are not talked about that often, and we'll, we'll hopefully mention some of those today. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the film, um, Paul Williams was the first African-American member of the American Institute of Architects, and its first African-American fellow. He was a remarkably uh, prolific architect who produced over 3,000 uh, projects in a near six decade career. He worked in, a, in an incredible uh, array of styles. He was, as his former colleague Jay Johnson described him, a master of creative eclecticism. And hopefully we'll get to show you some of those styles today. And al although his early work was kind of limited by the conventional demands of his clients, Paul Williams was an innovator and he doesn't get a lot of credit for it. And hopefully we'll give him a little bit of credit for that tonight too. One of the things that I really didn't realize when I started working on this project was just how prolific he was, to the point that in 1940, the architect and engineer says that perhaps uh, no other architect has, has had more success in domestic architecture than Mr. Williams. Now, if you, if you haven't seen the documentary, I'm gonna give you a very, very brief overview uh, of how Williams got started as an architect to put some context to what we'll talk about afterwards. But Williams is born in Los Angeles in 1894. 
uh, the population, according to the 1890 census in Los Angeles, was about 50,000. Of that 50,000, approximately uh, 1,200 folks were African American. Williams grew up at, uh, at an area around 8th and Santee that he later joked was way out in the country. His father, who sold uh, fruit and vegetables at a, a market downtown, dies two years after he was born from tuberculosis. His mother dies two years after that. He's taken in by a family that attends the same church. Um, as a student, Williams uh, attends Sentius Grammar School, where he's the only African-American kid in his class. And he later said he never really thought about it. The, his main memory of, of that early point in his life was being the class artist. Now, while at school, um, Williams sells newspapers. And one of his important clients uh, as a newspaper boy was Frank Putnam Flint. Frank Putnam Flint was an attorney. He'd later become an, an important senator. And he would later play an important role in launching uh, Williams' career. Now, Williams goes on to uh, study at uh, Polytechnic High School in Los Angeles that graduates uh, numerous in, uh, working architects in the city. He continues his education at various art schools and also at the University of Southern California while um, working for various uh, local architects. Um, he said that really his first uh, taste of the racism that he would experience throughout his career was when he started looking for a job. Williams uh, goes uh, looking at, uh, knocking on the doors of various architects who he knows for sure needs somebody with his skills only, be told, only to be told that they don't need him. Fortunately, he finds work with uh, Wilbur Cook, an important landscape architect where Williams learns to harmonize uh, landscape and architecture. He works for Reginald, Reginald Johnson, really one of the most important um, residential architects of Southern California at that period. Arthur Kelly, uh, perhaps best remembered today for designing what would become the Playboy Mansion. And uh, John C. Austin, an incredibly important uh, architect with a commercial practice and whose uh, work included uh, Los Angeles City Hall and the Griffith Observatory. And Austin is really important to Williams because it's while working for Austin that Williams decides to set up his own practice. Austin gives him a $90,000 commission and says, let this be a starter for your new office. Now, part of the reason, and this is, this is where I think things get really interesting, is that part of the reason that Williams is able to set up his own practice is because he's established himself as a small home specialist. Well, how, how did he do that? Well, he, he did that by uh, applying and, and submitting entries to numerous local and uh, national competitions. And he has success in, in, in a number of them. And this is one that I think is given pretty much almost no attention. And I think it, it should because it's really important. This is Williams entry to a, a 1920 competition organized by the Los Angeles Examiner for the best California home costing under $3,000. Now, these designs are significant because you start to see in Williams competition entries, the evolution of an important part of his design style. Now, at the time in Williams own words, the main focus for houses was, was at the front, the main entrance and the backyard was really for chickens in, in, in his words. And in some ways he kind of reversed that concept by making the front important, but shifting so much of the focus in a house to the back. So he, he, he shifts the kitchen forward and the dining room and the lounge to the back because he knows that most of life in a house happens at the back of the house. Now, this design is also important because it gets Williams an awful amount of a lot of attention. He writes articles about it. The examiner follow the house's construction. And the article is, is among one of many that get the attention of Frank uh, Putnam Flint. And Frank Putnam Flint is uh, no longer a senator. He's now a real estate developer. And he's purchased a la large portion of land uh, north of the San Rafael Hills that he intends to call Flintridge. He reads about Williams in the newspapers, reaches out to this kid, uh, well, reaches out to this uh, 
prestigious young architect, unaware that it's the same kid that he bought newspapers from all these years earlier. And Flint plays an important part in the early de development of William's career because he gives him a steady stream of work. And it, it's interesting to look at the, the houses that Williams designed in what would become Flint Ridge, including this, the John Bishop Greenhouse, the Flint Ridge Company House, and a house that, that, that Williams designed for um, Catherine Flint, who would, uh, by this point was Frank uh, uh, Flint's widow, because you see early on in his career, he's already capable of handling large commissions, and he already has that development of a, really a, a signature style of uh, and a mastery of harmonious proportions. Now, some of the early commissions in William's career that, that weren't residential include the uh, Second Baptist Church at 24th Street and Griffith Avenue and the East 28th Street YMCA building. Now, Williams had been a cadet at the Y on 9th Street and he was determined when he went for this project that he wouldn't be considered under any sort of uh, sentimental grounds. He wanted to be judged on his merits. And part of the reason that he was given this commission was because it was felt that he could offer the building a more home-like feel. And this is really the beginning of a trend that you'll see throughout William's career, that he's uh, brought in to design structures that aren't residences because he can give them a more home-like, warm, casual elegance which brings us to the first house that Williams designed that was included in the Architectural Digest. This is the Backman House, uh, built for Walter and uh, Juliet Backman. Walter Backman was an important uh, businessman in Los Angeles, and, and they, the Backmans bought the land for this house directly from G. Allen Hancock, who developed an exclusive neighborhood in Los Angeles called Hancock Park. And we often talk about Williams not being able to live in the neighborhoods or the houses that he designed. Well, what, what does that actually mean in, in practical terms? Well, what it means directly in terms of this house is that the contract uh, bet between Hancock and, and Julia Backman in this case includes a clause that says quite literally, said property shall not at any time be lived upon by any person whose blood is not entirely that of the Caucasian race. Now, I, I, I'm sure we've, we feature somewhere around 30 uh, residences in, in this book. Um, most of them, I think, have, and I'd have to check, most of them before 1940 have some sort of language in, in the original deeds that basically equates to that. As for the style of this house, it's a Spanish colonial revival house. Williams, while working for Reginald Johnson, would have designed numerous houses like this. Johnson was heavily inspired by the houses that Birch, uh, sorry, the, the buildings that Bertram Goodhue designed for the Panama, California Exposition. Their Spanish style and the ideal that you could use Spanish architecture in residences in California really caught on like wildfire. Here you see a wonderful uh, Chigaresque panel above the main entrance. I said that we would talk about the eclectic nature of Williams designs. And this is, an, an, and we're going from the Spanish colonial revival house to an English uh, Tudor house. Williams was really known for uh, reinventing his, historical forms in interesting new ways. And this house, like many of his other house, houses, had historical references on the outside. And inside, you would see a complementary but thoroughly mod modern floor plan. This house was built in 1929 for Nebraska native Fanchon Beer. It was featured in the Architectural Digest the following year. And it is remarkable that this house still stands and perhaps not for the reasons that you might imagine. In 1946, Howard Hughes, famed oilman, famed uh, movie producer, famed inventor, is flying an experimental X-11 aircraft attempting to make a landing in the nearby Los Angeles Country Club comes up short. And this is one of the houses that he smashes into. At the time, Hughes was only given a 50-50 chance of survival. I thought it was interesting that at the time of the crash, uh, Bira had married uh, Lieutenant Charles Meyer, who gained fame as one of the interpreters during the Nazi war crime trials. 
this stretch of uh, Whittier Drive in Beverly Hills is, is fascinating because uh, Williams designs the house uh, literally next door uh, for Lon Chaney, really one of the, the giants of the silent movie era, the man of a, a thousand faces. Uh, it's an Italian revival style home. Uh, Chaney hated going to restaurants where fans would obsess over his every move, told Williams to put a lot of focus on, the, on designing him a dining room where he could at escape all those fans. We spent a lot of time at this house uh, this week, and I thought it was fascinating that the, the woman who now owns it had lived in it as a child. Uh, at some point, uh, her family had sold it. She managed to buy it back uh, years later. She said there was a secret cupboard in the house that the, the subsequent owners had, had discovered but been an, unable to unlock. She knew how to unlock it, got inside, and of course, inside the secret cupboard is Paul Williams' uh, complete set of plans for the house which even though I had a mask on at the time, my grin was going ear to ear and, and extended way beyond the top of my mask. Um, anyway, uh, the same year that Fanch and Beert's house goes up, uh, uh, Williams designs a house for Jack Overcoat Atkin. Why is he called Overcoat? Because he never left house, uh, the house without one. Jack Overcoat Atkin first arrived in the United States as a teenager aboard a clipper ship he becomes a bookmaker and later a successful horse breeder. Um, he comes to Williams with this idea that he wants a house that reminds him of a castle that he's known growing up in England. Now think about that. You're an architect and, and a wealthy man, uh, the, uh, an important client comes to you and says a house that I, I, I want a house that looks like a castle. Your first reaction is probably to roll your eyeballs and think, oh dear, you know, what, what a, what a tacky request. But then I want you to think about that in context of a quote uh, from an interview that Williams' former boss, Arthur Kelly, gave, because it gives you a lot of insight into how Williams looked at the world. And Williams, uh, Kelly says, there seems to be a general feeling among the laymen that the architect will not let them have what they want in their house because it will spoil the architecture effect of it or some such thing of that. My notion has always been to get exactly what my client wants in their house, but do it in a proper way so there can be no objection from the architectural standpoint. Now, Williams would almost say exactly the same thing later in his career. If uh, a client gets the house that they want, I'm a good architect. But Williams would always take these ideas and convert them into something architecturally pleasing. In this case, he does it by uh, installing the house with, uh, uh, cr creating a house with Gothic archways, numerous coats of armor and other references to nobility. The house has a modern layout. It's featured in Architectural Dig Digest in 1930. Sadly, this house burned down in 2005 in the midst of an extensive renovation. At the time it was owned by Michael Hammer, the uh, grandson of tycoon Armand Hammer, who said that you could never, never replace what was lost here. And, and, and clearly you can see that is the case. Which brings us to a residence that would entirely change the trajectory of Williams' career. This is a house uh, he designed in 1930 for E.L. Cord. E.L. Cord was the head of the Auburn and, and Duesenberg automobile manufacturers. He's an extremely wealthy man. He reads about Williams' success, tracks him down because he's an acquired a 10 acre plot of land in Beverly Hills that he plans to call Cord Haven. And he wants to build a Southern colonial mansion that is really a gift to his wife and reminds her of the um, mansions that she would have known growing up in uh, Shreveport, Louisiana. Now Williams goes to meet Cord, unaware of whether Cord shares that common prejudice against him because of the color of, this, the color of his skin. But he soon discovers that the one thing that Cord worries about or is concerned about more than anything else is can you deliver? So uh, Williams develops a strategy that he kind of borrows from uh, Cass Gilbert who, who used it to get the commission to design the Woolworth building in New York City. And that strategy is to promise that you will, he will deliver the preliminary sketches by four o'clock the next afternoon. Cord didn't believe it was possible. Williams delivered, Cord told Williams to start with his 18 car garage. He went on to design the stables, uh, an Olympic sized swimming pool. 
He brings in uh, numerous factory workers from his plants to install expensive hardwoods, uh, custom freezes, murals. I spoke to one of Cord's uh, relatives, his grandson, who, who, who said, even though you, it seems like all of the furniture in this house is antique, it, antique, it's actually not. Cord refused to sit on anybody else's old furniture. The house, the house includes um, the music room that Williams described as the, the most beautiful room in the United States. It has uh, delicate green woodwork and saddened paneling. Uh, this house sadly was demolished in 1962. At the time, the Christian Science Monitor said that it was one of the most magnificent privately held uh, estates in the Western the United States. Um, which brings us to that house that Brett mentioned that was William's favorite house. I, I also included it here because it's the cover of the book. And now we've, we've been talking for about 15 minutes. And in that 15 minutes, we've seen a, a Spanish colonial revival house, maybe a couple of them, an English Tudor house, an Italian revival house, a Spanish colonial house. And now we have a house that is a, a blend of French uh, provincial and French Normandy architecture. So just in that small sample, you get an idea of the creative sources that Williams is pulling from. This is the 1933 house he designed for Henry Collins, stockbroker from Iowa, who moves to Southern California in hopes of improving his ailing health. It's a five bedroom, five bath house that was featured in the Architectural Digest in 1936. Uh, it's only had two owners. And as you can see, it looks remarkably the same. Now, as you, as you probably know, Williams made a name for himself designing houses for some of the wealthiest, richest, most influential people in the city. And this house is really no exception. It's uh, what was described as a modernized uh, Georgian design that he created for Lillian and Jay Paley. Now, Jay Paley had various business interests, but he's perhaps best remembered as one of the co-founders of the Columbia Broadcasting System, uh, better known as CBS. And here, here you see obviously William's mastery of harmonious proportions, but also you see his passion for undulating lines. And you see it has this wonderful uh, curved driveway that leads, leads up to the house, a feature in many of his more expensive um, properties. It was featured in the Architectural Digest in 1937. It has 32 rooms, including this, the games room, this, the wonderful bar, one of the things that distinguished uh, uh, Williams that he, he always worked with, well, whenever it was possible, he worked with the leading des interior designers of the day. Uh, in this property, he worked with Harriet Schellenberger. Outside, he worked with Huntsman Trout to design perhaps one of the most famous swimming pools in all of, or res privately owned swimming pools in all of the United States. This is the Sunburst and Zodiac swimming pool. And if you're sitting at home and you're thinking, I've got a little bit of money in my pocket, I'd really like to own a little piece of Paul Williams history. This house is currently for sale for a mere $75 million. Wow. Now, at the same time that he works on the Paley's house, Williams works on one of his most Im important commercial commissions. This is the Music Corporation of America building in Beverly Hills. Jules Stein, the head of MCA, comes to Williams uh, specifically because he wants an office building that has the warm, casual elegance of one of his residences. You see that trend continuing itself. Williams designs 30 offices with sweeping staircases, glamorous chandeliers. And as you see in this image here, he manages to incorporate two incredible iron gates that Stein uh, imports from Scotland. Now, the next house you might look at and you think, well, wh why? is this included? It, it, it looks really ordinary. There's nothing significant about this house until you, until you look a little bit closer and you realize that pretty much every part of this house that could be made out of steel was made out of steel. Steel paneling, steel uh, window frames, uh, steel roof, steel door frame, there's steel in the foundation, and perhaps Rather unsurprisingly, given that, it's called the Steel House. And it's one of 
uh, two homes that Williams was asked to design for the California House and Garden Exhibition on Wilshire Boulevard in Spalding in 1936. Um, the exposition was really intended to generate interest in home design and the products associated with it in Southern California. A host of other, well, uh, really just a small number of other architects, including Richard Neutra and Williams' former boss, Arthur Kelly, would be asked to design houses that would be built for the exhibition. The Steel House was designed in collaboration with Lear Steel Homes and, and replicas were available for sale. The other house that Williams designed for the exhibition um, was called the French House, this time steel frame with a, um, covered in plaster. The architectural form somewhat sarcastically noted that the, the house was French only in its vaguely uh, reminiscent French roof and the, the potted plants outside the door. Now, when we think about Paul Williams, it's really important to think about the details. And this is the, the Fulton house built for Robert and Fritzy Fulton. Robert Fulton owned the San Ray FAL Glass Company, one of the oldest buildings in downtown Los Angeles. As you see, the house has rather sort of unusual block-like massing. But if we look, take a peek inside, you see that what is really a signature element for Williams is that beautiful curved staircase. And then if we go into the library, it has a rather sort of innovative uh, wall of glass bricks that uh, provide ample light for reading without sacrificing any of your privacy. And perhaps the most wonderful thing about this house is that it's literally still there and it looks exactly the same. Now, at the beginning of this process of researching this book, I, I, I had a list of addresses. And if you were to, to ask me today, what had been the biggest surprise during this whole research process? It's this house. This is the 1938 house that Paul Williams, uh, a two-story English Tudor house that Paul Williams designed for Gladys Lerman. Gladys Lerman um, was a, a noted Oscar-nominated uh, screenwriter who wrote such films as Two Girls as a Sailor, Mexicali Rose. She, she also wrote a couple of Shirley Temple films. She achieved success at a time in which Hollywood was even more of a male dominated industry than it is today. And if we take a peek inside this house, you'll see it has a, a more traditional take on that um, signature Williams curved staircase. It also, as you'll see in the other image, has a wonderful uh, oval hallway, which is another uh, Williams feature. Uh, the house would later be acquired by film producer Fred Packard. It would go on to be owned by uh, Robert and uh, June Wyan, who started the Bob's Big Boy um, diner chain. And the reason the house was shocking to me is because I drove around it. I looked it up first on Google Earth and I, I drove around it and I got there and I, I just wanted to take a picture of it. And the house was covered up by this enormous uh, wooden boarding that, that went so high you couldn't see any part of it. And I could hear this uh, sort of hammering and sawing behind it. And I just figured, well, boy, I've timed this really badly. You know, um, they're doing the renovation on this work and I'll just come back when it's finished. And then a couple of weeks afterwards, uh, Brett emails me and say, no, they're not, they're not working on that house, they're demolishing it. And how, how, how that is possible in the 21st century with a house such a significant pedigree as this one, such a significant number of uh, important owners as this one is quite beyond me. Anyway, it, it brings, brings us to a house that to me in so many ways is pure, pure, pure Paul Williams. Now this, this house is the Coral House, built in 1939. Charles Coral at the time was one of the most important, famous uh, radio voices in the United States. He was half of a comedy duo, duo with Freeman Gosden uh, that produced the Amos and Andy radio show where they uh, played two African-Americans even though they were uh, both white guys. They only made uh, one film to together called uh, check and double check which bombed and Coral was later asked why do you think it bombed and he said well we, we didn't look the part 
Coral was actually a, a, a former bricklayer who helped uh, Williams uh, with the design of the, uh, the driveway leading up to the house. I uh, said this house is pure Williams. Now I want, I want you to look at the, the, the top part, the, the, the top of these two images. And you see that to get into this house, you have to go through or under this oval portico, pure Williams. You go into uh, an oval reception house, pure Williams. In, in the reception hall, we have this beautiful curved staircase. Again, it's pure Williams. At the back, we have a sympathetic porch looking out onto the, to the back, pure Williams, the playroom, the dining room, the places where you connected to where you would enjoy the back of the house are at the back of the house. The kitchen is moved to the front. It's part of that concept that we were, we were talking about earlier. Here is a, a close up of that oval hallway, part of uh, Williams design with a wonderful uh, curved staircase. Again, part of Williams design. His mastery of interior design leads to one of his most important commissions, which is to, uh, to work on Saks Fifth Avenue in Beverly Hills. E.L. Cord, whose house we saw earlier, sets up a meeting with Andrew Gimbel, the head of the Saks Fifth Avenue retail empire. Gimbel tells him that he, he wants a uh, department store that has the feeling of entering a fine home. Now, Donald Parkinson, another prominent architect of the period, designs the exterior of the first stage of construction. Williams uh, designs the second two. For the first stage of construction, um, they were so desperate to get this building underway. Uh, construction started even before the plans were finished. Uh, it was finished in five months, and the Los Angeles Times described the interior appointments uh, uh, which Williams designed as perhaps uh, the finest installed in any building on the west coast of the United States. Now, in 1940, um, we see Williams' work on Pueblo de Rio. And throughout this presentation, we've kind of talked about Williams designing expensive houses for rich people or rich uh, you know, com commercial structures for wealthy people. It's also very important to remember that Williams was a very uh, socially conscious designer. He worked on an, a number of important projects, including uh, one of the first federally uh, sponsored housing developments um, in the country in, in Langston Terrace in Washington, DC in the mid 1930s. You're looking at uh, Pueblo del Rio in, in South Los Angeles that would later be described as his most unorthodox work. Flat roofs, uh, uh, clean lines, grid-like streets really led to comparisons to housing pro projects that were um, developed in Germany. The thing that really fascinates me about Pueblo del Rio is that Williams is the senior architect and working with him and effectively under him is Richard Neutra, uh, Welton Beckett, uh, Gordon Kaufman. I mean, a total dream team of, of Southern California architecture. And moving into the 1940s, um, you see this massive shift in Williams uh, practice where by 1940, 60% of his office is a commercial, 40% is residential. Asked to explain that, Williams says that it's inevitable when you design houses for wealthy people that commercial projects will follow. The other guy in this picture is A. Quincy Jones, an incredibly important uh, architect who Williams in 1947 will form a partnership with for the purpose of designing hotels and clubs. They worked on more than 20 different projects together. Uh, I'm only going to mention one of them today, which was a redesign, a renovation and expansion of uh, the Palm Springs Tennis Club that had been a rather traditional structure. They transformed it into an experimental structure that really embraced its desert location. Um, Williams later said that he treated this as a laboratory for testing uh, new products and you know new ideas, new construction techniques. And if you if you look in the dining uh, the dining or the bar here, uh, you see this wonderful undulating lot two story bar that is pure Williams and these rather um, uh, distinctive walls of glass that are very uh, indicative of Jones. Now in the 1940s onwards, Williams, like many architects, this style uh, advances to 
include more modern ideas, uh, clean lines, and yet you still have this uh, wonderful sort of curved entryway that's pure Williams. This is a house that he designed in uh, 1947 for oilman Tevis Morrow in the Pacific Palisades. At the back of the house, you see again that recurring theme that you see in so many Williams houses that the focus of life, the focus of this house is at the back. The dining room, the lounge and other areas are at the back looking out at the pool. It still has what I think of as, as one of William's most beautiful staircases. Um, sadly, this house has been demolished. Now, we don't really have time today to talk about William's uh, work transforming what had been a thrifty mart into one of the, uh, the most cherished sought after restaurants in all of Los Angeles, Perino's. Um, it was really one of those uh, restaurants that was only one of the few restaurants that, that New York critics actually approved of. In fact, one New York critic actually said it was the only uh, sign of life uh, west of the Hudson. Uh, <laughs> we don't have time to talk about William's uh, work on the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Building, his work on the uh, Frank Sinatra House, although there is a wonderful clip in the, in the documentary, or, or his work on the first AME church although you can read about all of those in this book. And it was um, really a, a, a joy to research Williams. And I, I'm so glad again that we're, we're joined by the filmmakers who have made such a, a great contribution to the study of Paul Williams. And with, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to you, to you. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was great. I enjoyed that a lot. And Brett and Mark, thank you very much for your part of this. We have received so many um, wonderful questions from the students. Uh, and I'm really happy to say that their contribution to this is really important. Um, so I'll start, I've tried to organize because there were so many questions. I've tried to organize them so that um, they make a little bit of sense. So my first question will be directed to Royal and Kathy. And it's, um, how did you hear about Paul Williams and then come about to make the documentary? Um, and then the follow-up question to that is, what were your primary goals in making this film? Well, I'll begin. Uh, it was a, a, a personal connection. I had never heard of Paul Williams, even though I lived in uh, LA. And uh, it turns out that my husband uh, went to college with Karen Hudson's uh, brother, Karen Hudson, uh, uh, his granddaughter and biographer, who really did uh, with her first book in uh, 1994, I believe, uh, really inspired a revival of interest um, in Paul Williams. I'm not sure if we'd be talking about him today, except for those of you uh, who study him anyway, um, if it weren't for Karen. So she came out with her first book, um, which we talk about in the film, and she was traveling the country, uh, promoting it. We lived in Chicago. Um, she called uh, uh, us, uh, me and my husband, and said, will you give me a, a book party, which we did. When the books came, I was just stunned that they were gorgeous, the pictures were gorgeous, and that there was this African-American architect who had done so much, and I'd never heard of him. So we gave the party and I couldn't get it out of my head. Um, I saw immediately a film and um, I was working at PBS. A few years went by, we moved to Washington and um, I started on it seriously. And um, at that point I happened to meet Kathy. I actually had met Paul Hudson, the grandson, um, many years before and had found out then about the airport project. and was blown away again that this African-American architect had participated in such a unusual and interesting and, and important building. Um, and I never heard about Paul Williams again until uh, Royal and I were at a, a luncheon actually. And Royal said, well, I'm gonna have to um, leave. I'm not gonna be around to socialize very much because I'm working on a documentary about Paul Williams. I was the only one in the room who had ever heard of him. Um, but I'm like, oh my goodness, here's somebody else who knows about this man. And so at the time I said, well, Royal, if you ever need any help, 
let me know. And uh, fast forward, she called on me. I had uh, just left NBC and was doing independent production at the time. And she called on me and said, okay, I need help. And uh, we started working on it. That is, that's a wonderful story. Um, and so when you, was it different after you started working on it? Did your goals change in, in the middle of it? Or did you know what your focus was going to be from the very beginning? You know, we, Kathy and I have this great uh, partnership. You know, there may be little teeny disagreements, but we have the same goals. And I do have to say the wonderful thing about working with Kathy is, other than our talent, is we have similar backgrounds. We both at one time worked in news, but Kathy went on into management and executive producing, and she had all of the business skills and know-how that I didn't have. So we have the same point of view, but she, uh, uh, she brings something uh, more uh, to it. Um, as far as our goals, we, I think we did agree from the beginning. First of all, we wanted it to be accurate. We wanted it to be judged by the standards that we had uh, learned in news. And there was a lot out about Paul Williams and some of it was hearsay and some of it uh, uh, couldn't be verified. And we decided that for our documentary, every single person we interviewed had direct experience with Paul Williams, either the academics like Lonnie Bunch and Wes Henderson, who had done academic research on him. Of course, his two grandchildren, Karen and Paul, who actually knew him, Jay Johnson, who worked with him, and then, of course, the homeowners and, of course, Christopher Hawthorne. So we did, we did want it to be accurate and, and held to those standards. And we wanted it told from an African-American point of view. And Kathy, you can tell more about that. Well, there's a perspective that, uh, that I think we bring that um, from an African-American point of view, we, we have our own experiences that we bring to it. And while it may not be an overlay, it's, it's not strongly from a point of view, but there are certain nuances to the story that others, others may not have picked up. And so that was our goal to make sure that we were true to his story from the point of view of somebody who might have experienced similar um, slights, similar um, difficulties, similar uh, boundaries that were put in place. So, well, it, it, you've done a wonderful job. It is a fabulous documentary, and I think it's winning awards. You know that it hit the right spot with what people were looking for. Uh, at any time, but to bring it out at Black History Month last year was was a really a, a wonderful accomplishment because it really got it more, I would say, out into the people's reality. Um, so, Brett, I, I have a question for you. Uh, despite, and this is, comes from the students, I'm just using their voices. Despite their beauty and provenance, why are some of these incredible homes being torn down? That's the first question. And then the follow-up, is there a historic preservation group working successfully to prevent the beautiful Paul Williams homes from going under the bulldozer? Sure, sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll answer in two parts. As far as homes being torn down, it's usually a matter of the dirt being so valuable that the highest and best use from a, from, from a formula standpoint is to tear the house down, which can, with by today's standards was a modest size, tear it down and put up a big white box between 10, 12, 14,000 square feet. There's a market out there purchasing those homes. If there was no market to buy them, they wouldn't be built. But let's backtrack a little bit. It depends on where the historic home or Paul Williams home is located. I'll speak to Los Angeles in that there are about 38 neighborhoods under what's called an HPOZ zone, Historic Preservation Overlay Zone. And if your home is in one of those zones, you really can't take it down. There are many entities that are there to either stop you or to assist you 
in properly updating or upgrading or remodeling. Typically, you cannot touch the facades of these homes. Unfortunately, many of these magnificent homes are in Bel Air, Homeby Hills, Brentwood, etc. These areas are so wealthy. They were always affluent, but they're extraordinarily affluent today. Rich people do not want to be told what they can do with their homes. These areas have very successfully thwarted historic preservation um, overtures and don't have any protections whatsoever. Conversely, Hancock Park, which is literally in the geographic center of Los Angeles, it's made up of five neighborhoods, Windsor Square, uh, Hancock Park, Brookside, Larchmont, and Fremont Place. They were some of the early adopters of HPOZs. Therefore, when you drive through them, they're enchanting because they still have the original 1920s and 1930s feel. As I said this morning in a seminar, you can pay me now or pay me later. You're, maybe you can get a home now at a lesser price than an HPOZ, but you're going to have to put money into it to renovate and whatnot, but you're going to make your money at the end. These neighborhoods are preserved and people desire them because of the charm and the ambiance that they still possess. Whereas another neighborhood that does have teardowns, you have these new white boxes polluting the area visually, you know, they're visually assaulting our senses. Those areas, yes, they're expensive, but Hancock Park is still desirable. The other areas are merely tolerated. So in time, the older historic areas will grow in value because of the desirability. Well, how many do you think have been raised? How many Paul Williams homes have gone by way of the bulldozer? You know, that I don't know, but my first book was on Paul, it was on uh, Gerard Colcord, who also was a very prominent architect of the, of, of the time. And I found at least, of the 300 homes he did, I found at least 50 that were completely bulldozed. And of course, those were in areas with no ordinances whatsoever. Also remember, because it's important for context, is, is, is the overlay zones are relatively new, maybe 20, 30 years old. Um, we got on the bandwagon late, unfortunately. Thank goodness we've saved quite a few, but I think a lot of the damage has already been done. Mm -hmm. I, um, I have to make, uh, I want to add on that and uh, thank you, uh, uh, Brett. Uh, as far as an organization, um, if, uh, there is the LA Conservancy and they do try, and you saw Linda Dishman uh, interviewed in the, uh, in the film, um, but you know, they have a, a huge area to cover right. and they can't keep track of every single home. There's also an historic commission Right. that uh, reviews um, things. And I have to say, if there is one travesty that um, uh, I have to talk about, it's the Frank Sinatra home. Oh. Uh, the Frank Sinatra home is no longer with us. Um, and to me, um, when you have a home and it's in one of those areas that uh, was in one of those areas that Fred is talking about, um, Holmby Hills, I'm not sure where it was, but when you have three icons of American culture, um, Edward R. Murrow, who did the program, uh, Frank Sinatra, who lived in the home, and then Paul Williams, um, the fact that they couldn't save it is just, you know, it was, it was the, the day I heard about that was one of the saddest days of this whole uh, process. Uh -huh. Well, in the film, uh, re I remember uh, it showed this this couple who were next door to a Paul Williams home, and she went out and stopped the bulldozers. At, I mean, because yes. she was outraged. It had been saved, and the the guy said, "Money will. We're just doing the job." I mean, it had already been saved, and they were still going to tear it down. Uh, so far, um, that house is uh, still standing. Um, uh, the Igers, uh, that was that couple, Robert Iger, right. the uh, uh, head um, of Disney, um, uh, and his wife, um, Willow Bay, uh, she did run out uh, in front of the bulldozers. Um, fortunately, he's well known. He knew exactly what to do. He called the newspaper. So the LA Times went running out there. They and their neighbors got together and went to the Historic um, um, Preservation Commission, and um, they were able to save it. Um, 
uh, for now. Yeah, but that's a person who knew ahead of time and had right. clout. Knew what to do. So this next question can just be, it's, it's from two different students. One wanted to know if Paul um, Williams designed anything in the Bay Area. And then another one wanted to know if, there, if he designed anything in Pennsylvania. <laughs> okay, for the Bay Area, there is one home in Pacific Heights. Right. And then there's another one in a suburb. The Pacific, Pacific Heights um, home is uh, uh, very traditional, as you might imagine. There is another one in a suburb. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting the name uh, now that is a little more modest and uh, 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 more uh, modern. Uh, but that's about it uh, for the Bay Area, as far as I know. I don't know of anything in Pennsylvania. But <laughs> I, I will say this, um, uh, some of the questions about exactly how many designed and uh, exactly how many survived that we never could exactly say because the office records were destroyed in, in, in the fire. Um, uh, now that the Getty and USC have the archives and they are going through them painstakingly, um, they were in wonderful condition, but now they're in museum uh, care uh, mm -hmm. We may know the answers to some of those mm -hmm. questions. Um, well, um, there, I have a question to follow up on that later. It's further down my list. I'll come back to it, but it, it, fo it follows up on that one. Um, Mark, I wanted to ask uh, you as an architect, because most people are very taken by the fact that Paul Williams could sketch upside down. And one of the students asked, did he also do his own perspective renderings? Uh, the this student said that the pencil perspectives in the book are so beautiful. And he wondered if Paul Williams did those himself or if he had staff to do those. My, my guess is that early on, he did quite a lot of his own drawing. I um, mean, he was, he was noted for being uh, an excellent draftsman and designer. Uh, okay. Drawing upside down is something you hear occasionally. Uh, Sir Edwin Lutyens was notorious in the same way. Um, it allowed you to sit opposite your client um, and face your client um, and, and impress your client, needless to say, because you were drawing <laughs> upside down. But I think Stephen uh, brought up a, an anecdote about Williams in this regard, that it may have also had early on in his career when he was a black man working in a white man's world, uh, that he couldn't sit next to necessarily his client, but it was okay for him to sit across from them. Um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I think Williams is amazing because the success of his career says a lot in a way to me about two character traits that he, he really exhibited. One was his ability to listen. Uh, and the other was his ability to collaborate. And it's clear he was a great collaborator because late in his career, many, many ar white architects wanted to work with him and wanted him to be part of a team. But the design talent he brought you know, to this equation was what made him a really remarkable architect. And I have to believe that he, he was very capable of drawing whatever he wanted. It isn't that he didn't, like a lot of successful architects, eventually have a successful office with a great deal of help. But um, the fact that he did this many buildings, he would have had to have that help. Right. right. But, but that doesn't take away from, the, from his his talent as a designer and, 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 and you know his, his talent is in a lot of these details. It's just without question. Mm -hmm. Do any of you know if he hired interior designers on his staff or was his staff made up totally of architects? And did he hire women architects? Do any of you know that? I don't, I, I never came across him hiring any woman uh, female architects. He obviously worked with a number of um, uh, female interior designers over, over the years. Um, 
uh, but I'm, 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 I didn't come across a, a woman working in his office, but I think uh -huh. you know, Paul Williams was open-minded enough that if that opportunity had come along, I think he probably would have taken it. Right. So um, either Royal or Kathy can maybe answer this. What was Paul Williams' relationship with and impact on the African-American community? The documentary mentions that uh, Paul Williams was the first member of the AIA. Then how many African-American members does that organization have today? Do you know that? Well, I'm going to let Kathy talk about the first part of that, the relationship with his own community, because it was very strong. Yeah, he, um, he straddled both worlds. And that is one of the amazing things about this man, was his ability to navigate the white world and then still be a functioning, viable, community-minded member of the Black world. And um, he was very conscientious about making sure that Blacks could buy homes. He felt that home ownership was critical to the success of a Black family and a Black community. So the, his whole relationship with Broadway Federal uh, where he collaborated to create um, a mechanism for Blacks to get loans to buy homes. This was part of his commitment to the Black community. And incidentally, he designed the building in the Black community. Um, he always made sure that he covered his people. And he, he was a, you know, a functioning and, and um, viable member of the Black community. Yeah. Um, so one another question came up on why are some other black architects like Albert Irvine Cassell, uh, Vertner Tandy and Hillard Robinson not as visible in the mainstream media as Williams, uh, the, the person who wrote this question feels that he these others were as talented and he wondered if his work if Williams work with Hollywood elites helped him get further because of that connection versus the talent? Well, I, uh, uh, Hillary Robinson actually uh, uh, was uh, the collaborator um, on Langston Terrace. Uh, Werner Tandy, I think I know that name. He was much earlier, I think, mm -hmm. I'm pretty sure. And I'm not familiar with the, the last one, but you really hit on it, Kay, Hollywood. Um, uh, he, uh, he was enormously talented as we know, uh, but that Hollywood connection um, and the mass media of today um, is one of the reasons that um, he is so well known. He, um, there's no doubt about it. Um, architect to the stars, the stars of the past and the stars of today. So that is, um, uh, it. I do know uh, that um, uh, people I've met through NOMA, the National Organization of Minority Architects, are trying to correct uh, that, um, uh, that fact. And uh, there is an encyclopedia, part one of, of African American architects. And I think uh, uh, they're working on part two um, as well. But here's the thing, only 2% of architects, licensed architects in the US right now are African-American. Uh, so, you know. Still today, still today. Yeah, still yeah. today, yeah. Wow. I had no idea it was that small, really. Yeah. Um, as, an, as an architect, I, 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 if I may jump in here, uh, my entire career I've confronted uh, the sort of gender, uh, differential. Uh, it's, it's not just Blacks, it's women as well. Um, one of the architects that I love to talk about that's, that's uh, in, in your San Francisco neighborhood is Julia Morgan. Yes. She, she was in many ways like Williams, but this was long before Williams. Uh, the first of her kind. She was not only the first woman uh, graduate of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, 
It took her two years pounding on the door to get in, by the way, when she went to Paris. Uh, she was the first American woman, but the first woman as well to graduate from the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. Mm -hmm. She did more buildings and one could argue perhaps just as great buildings did more buildings in less time than Frank Lloyd Wright. She was only acknowledged by the AIA, our professional organization, uh, three years ago with a gold medal. Mm -hmm. I, I think, you know, Williams, I'm just so w delighted that Williams is enjoying this spotlight. He deserves it. But in a, in a way, I, our, doing this project of the books has been very informative because when you look at the architectural digest of the 1920s and 30s and 40s, and you ask who had the most entries of any architect, and this is admittedly a bastion of rather aristocratic elderly white practitioners, the one who architect who had the most entries in the architectural digest, even back then, was Paul Williams. And I didn't know that. <laughs> and, I, and that says a lot to me, uh, but it also speaks to what a really brilliant architect he was. I mean, he just did good work. Yeah, he did. You know, black, white, green, purple. I mean, this man was brilliant. But I think another aspect of his personality that that propelled him was his grace, his presence, his ability to to speak to anybody. And, and I have wondered if his childhood being the only black kid in a white school, if that somehow prepared him to operate in this white world all these years later. Yeah, I think it's a good, that's a good point. Uh, you know, Mark, I'm also wondering along that, along those lines, if his physically being in California didn't foster his success, which hopefully was more um, inclusive and allowing of a black man to flourish. Certainly less socially conservative, perhaps. Right. Unlike New York City at the time. Right. Or Boston. Sure. Uh, I have to say that um, uh, Lonnie Bunch, who uh, um, is uh, who was uh, interviewed for the film and uh, is uh, before he became head of the Smithsonian and founder of the African American Museum, was a historian specializing on the West, and he basically says that Paul Williams' um, career probably couldn't have happened anywhere else except. In, the, in California and that in that kind of narrow time, he would have been successful whatever he did anywhere because that was the kind of personality he had. But those things came together. Um, you had the tremendous explosion of population, people coming to California. They needed new buildings, they needed homes, they needed everything. And then Hollywood brought the money and they were more liberal. Um, uh, you know, he, he, um, he actually, uh, uh, two of our interviewees say, um, uh, the Jews uh, uh, moving from the East Coast who had experienced prejudice uh, themselves uh, were much more open and wanted to uh, uh, work with whoever had the best talent. So he was definitely in, in the right place. Uh, California, uh, that's definitely part of the answer. It was a perfect storm. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, absolutely. Everything came together. One thing I, I, I found interesting too is that you look at Paul Williams and you think about his uh, competition success and you think about him entering all these different competitions and you know um, in some way in in some kind of, kind of weird way they almost gave him a level playing field that society didn't give him you know because if you were submitting a, con a competition entry more likely than not it's not going to ask you what race you are and you know they would see this you know Paul Williams they wouldn't raise any eyebrows you know so in in a, in a weird kind of way he proved himself to be as good or if not better in many cases than, than most of his competitors. And I think that as a strategy to establish himself was a really important part of putting, putting himself on the map. 
so Stephen, can can I ask you this? The documentary um, really showed that uh, Mr. Williams was able to design across different styles very successfully. He was also able to design across different typologies from residential to civic to commercial and so on. In regards to his residential work, his granddaughter said, his value as an architect was determined by his ability to please his clients. Did, did Paul Williams ever express, express a building typology or a design style that he personally valued more or was more drawn to? Um, I, 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 don't, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think um, what's really remarkable about um, the, the, the Williams is the sheer range of projects that he worked on. I mean, it's, it's hard to sit here and say, I think it would be the hardest question to answer if would be somebody would answer, ask you, is there a type of building that Paul Williams didn't design? I mean, I would be, I would, I would sit here and I, I'd have to really scratch my head and, and try and think of something. I mean, it's, it's churches, it's schools, it's houses, it's all the full gamut of houses, every style you can think of, every type you can think of, you know, military bases. It, it just goes on and on. I, I've often sat here and thought, well, what, what didn't he design? You know, <laughs> what, I mean, you know, I mean, the, the, the range is just incredible. And I think in some ways, the fact that you can't pin Paul Williams down to one style, that you can't pin him down to one type of building is what defines him. The, the sheer fact that he was so skilled that he could literally take on anything. So, um, Brett, there are these homes of all these styles. Um, the, the film indicated that, that successful people of color uh, now wanna buy these Paul Williams homes. Do you see a lot of that? Um, that they're buying these homes just because Paul Williams designed them and it's part of their heritage. You know, I don't know, I don't have specific examples to say black people are buying Paul Williams homes. I do have evidence that more culturally aware people are naturally drawn to a good house by a good architect. You know, Paul Williams was prolific in Los Angeles. So chances are, you know, there, there's a very good chance that, you know, you can buy a Paul Williams home. Um, they're, they speak to everybody, but, 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 but I don't know of necessarily black people specifically buying Paul Williams homes. Okay. Um, you know, good aesthetically oriented people want aesthetically oriented houses. Yeah, true. Yeah. So um, one, another student asked, how involved was Paul Williams in details? such as light fixture specifications and design. For example, he's, this student writes, the starlight fixtures surrounding the retractable roof Williams designed for the El Mirador Hotel in Palm Springs. How involved and how hands-on was he working with his interior designers on details? Um, I think I think the easiest way. Uh, sorry, well, if you want to jump in or anybody else, but I think you are more of an expert. I really um, don't know as de as uh, those kind of details like you do. Well, I think I, I think I think the easiest way to answer that question um, is to look at what who Jay Johnson is is in your you know documentary said about him, and Jay Johnson said everything that came out of the office of Paul Williams had his hand in it, so that 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 answers your question, you know. He, he, yeah. He out of his office, he had a hand in it. So I think it's really as simple as that. So another question was Austrian architect Rudolf Schindler also worked in Los Angeles at the same time as Paul Williams, but their work was very different. Um, so do any of you know, did they ever work together or did they even know each other? Um, I'm sure they probably would have known each other on, on, on some level. I'm not, not, not aware of them, um, you know, working together, but, you know, in, I mean, one of the interesting things about Williams is, is at, at some point he would have designed houses that had elements of, 
things that Shinda was working working with mm -hmm. or, or with Shinda's style, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm sure they probably knew each other, but no projects as far as I know. So, Kathy, is the Langston Taylor dwelling, pro the project designed in Washington, considered today to be a successful example of public housing? Yes, it is. It's Langston Terrace. And yes, it's still operating. Um, yeah, it's it's considered an important part of DC. Absolutely. And it's, and not, have the only, it's not the only building in DC. Um, there are a number of buildings up on Howard University's mm -hmm. campus mm -hmm. that are still standing and um, that Paul Williams designed. In fact, he was even on the board of the university at one point. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was gonna bring that up. Mm -hmm. I love the part, this is just me talking now, not a student question, but uh, how he worked on St. Jude Hospital and he did it for free because he loved the children and Danny Thomas was his best friend. I never had heard that story ever before. I, I wasn't even aware he had, he had been the architect on that. So, um, yeah, I thought that was a beautiful part of the film, uh, a very uh, personal, emotional part of the film. I, you know, um, every time I see Karen and Marlo talking back and forth, almost like they're in the same room. Um, we were lucky that it cut together that way. But yeah, um, yeah he uh, they met and there was that bond formed and um, they did that uh, project together. Um, because uh, you know they both had um, impoverished childhoods, and um, uh, I think St. Jude's was the first integrated hospital in the South. I think Marlo said that, um, and they wanted that kind of hospital for children that any uh, any child could go there. It's a wonderful story. Um, so. Um, how did Paul Williams come up with the idea of using, obviously this is question is for all of you or any of you, um, how did he come up with the idea of using an A-frame as the structural system for the Guardian Angel Cathedral? Was he the first to do it or was he inspired by someone else? Do any of you know that? I don't know. I wish I knew the answer to that question. I mean, he was obviously very well read and followed architectural trends. I don't I don't know who inspired him for that building. But, you know, I mean, like many architects of the period, you studied obsessively and mm -hmm. you took a great interest in anybody else's work. So um, it'd be interesting to know the answer to that. I don't know if anybody else knows it. Have, have Paul Williams um, buildings been given landmark status? Yes, um, let's see. Um, I believe the Beverly Hills Hotel has landmark status. The homes, uh, the, 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 the um, couple that um, we did interview, uh, they uh, uh, worked very hard to um, bring their home, um, the Sweeney uh, uh, couple, um, uh, Cheryl and John Sweeney worked very hard to uh, uh, bring their home to the, um, the standards of the National Trust. So that home has landmark status. I believe the MCA headquarters building has protection from at least the city of Beverly Hills. Um, and I think the Golden State building uh, may also have a uh, landmark status from the city. I think there are others too, mm -hmm. uh, but those are, the, uh, those are the ones that I can name uh, offhand. That's, well, that's good to hear. That's a step mm -hmm. in the right direction. Um, the, uh, one, another student asked this question, Kathy or Royal, the question is, Paul Williams had to fight so hard against oppression to make a name for himself. In doing this, did he accept lower pay than his white colleague? If so, did he start making more or equal to what a white architect would have been making just at that time? 
Now, I don't Kathy? know for sure, but I don't think he, it, I don't think he took less. I think he um, established himself as worthy of what any other architect should earn, in fact, maybe even more. And so he did not accept less, as far as I know. You know, Stephen, and Stephen's got some great follow-up to that about how he visited with his clients um, about the amount of money that they would spend. Stephen, remember? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, one of the things I was thinking about is like, you know, around the time that he was working on Langston Terrace, he gave that great interview where he said, I won't do a, I won't do a house for less than $20,000 unless you're my friend. You know, he did, he did. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> he didn't need to. Um, so is there anything currently uh, being done to um, find and preserve more of his buildings uh, because of the huge loss in the LA fires. I think maybe they're talking about the, the archives and drawings. Um, are they? Well, um, I, I uh, do have an answer for that. There was a rumor and it wasn't true that everything was lost in uh, the uh, burning of the bank. That is not true because fortunately, Karen Hudson was already working on the book and she had taken all the creative material home, thank God. So she had the blueprints, those gorgeous renderings that we used at the end over the credits, all the creative material, the, uh, uh, the drawings, all of that. What was lost was um, uh, the records, you know, the office records, um, who the clients were, how much, you know, the, the dealing with the contractors, uh, the business records. But thank God she was working on that book um, because th that is the material that now uh, is at the Getty and, um, uh, jointly owned with um, USC and the scholars are looking on, uh, through it and we'll know a lot more and hopefully uh, some of those things will eventually be on display. Oh, that'll be great. Um, so um, I think that, that the, another question that someone had was that, um, it because it was mentioned in the film, that he, he didn't have the luxury to say no to a clients. Uh, and so this, this student is saying that they assume that that's part of the reason why he had such an eclectic style uh, of work because he, he, he tried to give the clients what they want. And th the question was, was there anything he would absolutely not do? That's a great question. And I don't Steven know. Stephen and Brett. I... Mm -mm. It just never has come out that that was a good question. That is well, here's, a, here's, a, here's an idea. I just um, recently came across a motel in Las Vegas that he designed, a very futuristic design that, I mean, it it's Las Vegas style. And oh. so I, I would say probably not. <laughs> <laughs> what they wanted that's what he gave them and it's still standing it's still standing the other, the other it's thing about the, the eclecticism of the work was uh not just williams but the the entire climate that he grew up in uh his apprenticeships uh the other architects uh that that were his immediate seniors were also quite eclectic in terms of their ability to jump from one style to the other, not just, not just unwittingly, but knowledgeably. Uh, architects like Gordon Kaufman, Wallace Neff, Rome Coate, I mean, we, we've covered it in some of the, the earlier volumes, were also quite capable of working in different styles. And, you know, for me, it was what always attracted me to these, these architects was that versatility and the diversity of their work. I didn't see it in contemporary architecture where the language is rather consistent mm -hmm. and sometimes rather bland. 
So what happened to Paul Williams's business when he retired? Did he just retire and shut it down? Or and what happened to the his staff who was working for him? Well, um, uh, none of his um, children <laughs> um, became architects. And I think, unfortunately, because he um, had such a large footprint, um, the practice um, uh, did end uh, with his retirement. Yes, yeah. unfortunately. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that usual, Mark? Uh, uh, or... when, when you, if, if you don't, as a practitioner, um, start on, on, a, on the road to an ownership transition with the people that are working for you, uh, yes, that happens. And especially if you are the, you are, as, as, as was just said, you have, a, you, you're the one with the big footprint. You're the one with the name on the door. Right. Um, if you're not passing that torch along in a way long before you, you stop practicing, the chances of the office surviving uh, a, a person who has that kind of stature uh, is is not not usually going to happen. Mm -hmm. You know, and in, in that regard, Paul Williams was very very lucky in that his granddaughter Karen basically saved the legacy. You know, so uh, Paul Williams had two daughters, and as Mark uh, somebody said, neither became architects. In 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 those days, I mean, he he retired in seventy three and then died in nineteen eighty. In those days, architects didn't have the status that they do today. So oftentimes, you know architect granddad died, the family didn't know his or her significance and basically threw the archives away. Mm -hmm. they, they, they put him in, you know, the, the dumpster arrived and they threw away the legacy. You know, Karen really needs to be credited with the saving of, for all intents and purposes, LA's greatest architect uh, for, for many reasons. There are many fine architects, but he's so significant for many reasons. She saved it. And I don't know if architects would, would receive the same attention that Paul Williams did if we didn't get on the track of realizing that these architects were so significant, mm -hmm. which I think has probably only been about 20, 25 years that we've really taken them seriously. Yeah. Um, Stephen, in what ways were people's uh, expectations of an African-American architect limiting and in what ways were they freeing? Um, well, they, they were obviously ex extremely limiting. It was, it's kind of um, it's kind of horrible to read about Williams describe um, people come into his office having seen a beautiful uh, Paul Williams house, not realizing that he was an African American architect, walking into his office and then freezing, you know, and then to think that. You know, so much of William's early career was uh, built around how to confront that aspect. Um, you know, and you see Williams create all these different psychological techniques where he would say to people, uh, you know, that would, would freeze, um, you know, well, well, what's your budget? And then, then he would, you know, carefully sort of reject them and then, you know, tell them what he would do with their house and hope that in that time that they would sort of warm to him a little bit and get get used to him you know um so that that was incredibly uh, you know cre incredibly limiting um it's interesting when when you get into the 1960s the, because um so few uh, african-american architects have reached anywhere near the level of prominence that williams has that he starts to see race as one of his um greatest assets you know that he's managed to survive into that period and it's all it, I think the unusual nature of having an African American architect, which is obviously, it's sad that you know there were so few of them and, st and still are. But he, he he recognized that sometimes he would get work for that reason alone. So in some in some ways, it, it played it played into his favor, but it, it doesn't you know go anywhere close to making it right what he went through. That's very interesting. Um, we're getting down to some of the last questions now. Um, maybe Brett or Mark can answer this. Uh, 
Paul Williams was working in Los Angeles at the same time as architect Wallace Neff, who was also stylistically very versatile. Did they know each other or ever collaborate? Wait, Mark, you better take that one. I don't, I don't, I don't know. Maybe Stephen might know whether they collaborated or not. I, I would hazard a guess that they definitely knew each other. I mean, they're both actually noted for being architects to the stars. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that same moniker uh, is used with Neff. So they probably knew each other and occasionally were in competition with each other uh, for certain clients is my guess. But I, I, I can't give you, I don't have any, uh, any knowledge of the meeting or knowing each other socially or anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, well, um, Williams and Wallace Neff actually worked on a, an, an unrealized uh, project to build bubble houses in Las Vegas. And, and Neff was kind of known for, for, for bubble homes, um, which, you know, very sort of simplistic domed houses. Uh, um, I mean, to me, that just fits in with this whole um, notion of, of Williams being ready to experiment. You know, I, one of the things that you know, really surprised me is that, you know, Williams built concrete houses, you know, as, as an experiment. You saw the steel house in, in the presentation. Um, he built uh, pre prefabricated houses that, you know, you could put up in kit form. So I think him, him and Neff probably hit it off on that idea of trying to find out what the next new thing is. Mm -hmm. um, and would that be the, the same with Frank Lloyd Wright? Because the, there's a picture of them together um they so they obviously knew each other Did... yeah I don't, I, I don't know if they um ever even talked about collaborating with each other i mean it would certainly be a, a you know a fascinating collaboration if they'd done it i would you know I, if you could have a time machine and sit in on one of their conversations it would just be so awesome to see well what would they think about you know yeah. what would they talk about i mean that conversation would just be you know Get, get me back to the future and, and figure out what that is. That would be awesome. <laughs> you know, Kay, Kay with, with that question, um, I did ask Karen Hudson, what kind of car did your grandfather drive? And she said he usually had Lincoln Continentals. Well, Frank Lloyd Wright did as well. And there's a rumor, I, I hope it's true because it's wonderful, is that Frank Lloyd Wright would uh, take out the rear view mirror because his motto was he never looks backwards. <laughs> that's incredibly unsafe but i want it to be true because it's frankly right. but right you know, but but i thought i don't know if karen was ever asked that but i wanted to know what granddad drove right. that's, that's a good question um so i'm down to two two questions because of our time and um i think they're great so i'll, I'll i think that the first one i'll ask brett Stephen, or mark uh, what advice do you think that Paul Williams would have offered today to students of design um, who are experiencing adversity themselves in this day? Um, I think I think the first thing he would say was would 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 really be dedicated to your craft, you know, and almost obsessive about it. I think one of the things that distinguishes Paul Williams is that he knew from a child that there was one thing, one purpose for him in life, and it was to become an architect. And he was going to do it no matter what people say. And I think he believed in his own ability and, you know, and, and he was prepared to study and back it up, you know? So I think, you know, even if, if you have people telling you, you're not good enough, you can't do it. You're never going to be right for this, you know, or you're not the right person to do that, but you know, it's you. If you know inside of you that there's that voice that says, you, you, this is what you should be doing and stick it out. I think that's exactly what he would say. I think he would just say, stick it out. If yep. it's for you, stick it out. I, I was asked a similar question uh, in my role as a realtor with a, with a Zoom call a couple of weeks ago, and we were talking about passion. And I think Paul Williams was absolutely driven. As Stephen just said, he knew what he was, he knew what he had to be, and there was simply no discrepancy between the two. He was going to excel and be successful. But anybody on the planet today, just catch yourself daydreaming. Whatever that is, that's what you're going to excel at. 
you don't need a $5,000 seminar to tell you what you're good at. But what you dream about, what you think about, what magazines you gravitate towards, what you talk about with others, find a consistent thread and whatever that is, you know, jump on the gas pedal. And regardless of what anybody says, that's what you're going to do and be. It's, mm -hmm. I don't think Paul Williams listened to the outside world. I think he heard it, but I think he successfully navigated around it. Mm -hmm. I think he heard it. I think he felt it. I think he built up a built up a shield to protect himself from it. And I think that the thing that he would say today is steal yourself, expect indignities, expect to be treated less than, but don't let it change how you feel about yourself. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so Kathy and Royal, I've saved the last question for you. Uh, as, as Paul Williams was living his life, did he realize that the impact he was making on the Black community and on society as a whole? And what, what do you want for audiences to take away from viewing your documentary? Well, I'll take the first one. Um, he definitely uh, knew the impact uh, that he had on his own community at that time. He and his wife were right in the heart of the thick of things of the African-American community of LA uh, through their church, through their social connections, and through all the things that he did uh, for the community, like Broadway Federal. Uh, so I think he knew uh, 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 about that. I don't think he ever could have dreamed of the impact that he has today. Um, I, um, I don't think that um, he could have dreamed that uh, we would be uh, talking about him um, today. I think he'd be delighted, but um, I think he just lived in his moment. Uh, Kathy, um, yeah. uh, for um, the next question, the last question. Yeah, you know, there's a quote from Lonnie Bunch in the film that it's important for us to preserve our history because otherwise black people will believe they've never done anything. When we talk to uh, different architects, black and white, you'd be surprised at how little they knew about Paul Williams, how his name was not even brought up in many of their classes. And so what we want people to take away from this is that this man existed and he, was he was unique in his way, but there are many, many, many other black heroes and leaders who have built this country. He's just one of them. And you know, I, I love that we're identifying his his individuality, but he's not the only one. And we want people to know that that they have a history, black people have a history, Americans have a history that includes black people and everybody needs to be aware of that. Well, thank you. Um, so thank all of you. Thank you panelists so much. Um, especially on behalf of the Academy of Art University and our School of Interior Architecture and our president Stevens, um, I, I can't thank you for sharing your work and your insight. And as seen in a black and white photo that we pulled off of the, um, the uh, documentary, it's obvious that Paul Williams had great style. I think that was one of the keys to his success. Of course, he had extraordinary talent, but he also had that gift, the, the presence. Um, he dressed the part, he acted the part, and that is just what and who he was, I believe. Um, I was so taken by something his grandson said in the documentary, it's not his art as much as it's his journey. So thank you all for attending tonight. Students, take this inspiration to heart. Someday we may be talking about you this way. So thank you everyone and good night. <laughs>